Chairman. I'm already presented the, during the, the question. So I'm Cristiano Albonetti from Bologna, uh, from the CNR, the other part of research of Bologna. And thanks for, to Tobias for the nice presentation of Bologna because uh, he has made like an advertisement of the city. And um, today I don't speak about of a particular technique of scanning probe microscopy, but uh, I speak about of uh, something that scanning probe microscopy technique applied to the growth of materials. So if you want this more devoted uh, on, on the, the growth of the material, the, the characterization of the material itself, more than uh, scanning probe. Anyway, I want to know, ah, okay, the pointer is there. Um, this work is, uh, has been done a long time uh, during the year with uh, some collaborators from, uh, from Spain, from Ricardo Garcia Group, and uh, some my former degree and PhD students. So, the main idea, I'm sorry for the presentation in such a way because it uh, has been changed from PDF to uh, PowerPoint, but there is no problem. So, uh, the, the topic and the motivation behind of this work is related to the one that, uh, that Tobias spoke before, is uh, on organic electronics. So the idea to fabricate something uh, starting from molecules. So it's clear that uh, if you start from single molecules and uh, you form a film, the morphology of the film uh, drive uh, your electronic properties as uh, Tobias said. So in particular, when you form devices by using very small molecules which are sublimated in vacuum, you form a well-ordered film, but the electrical electronic properties are really strictly um, correlated with the morphology of the film. And uh, we have shown this point uh, in 2004 in a Dinelli paper which explained how the charges in an organic field effect transistor is uh, confined in the first two or three monolayer of the material. So is it clear that control the growth mechanism behind the formation of the film is crucial to obtain a film which works very well? <clears throat> in this sense, uh, the first point uh, is uh, understand how form this film in vacuum. So you use uh, um, a Knudsen cell, which is like uh, um, a boat, a copper boat, uh, where the powder of the material is placed inside it. The, the Knudsen cell is heated around at 240 degree, and uh, the, uh, the Knudsen cell is mounted inside of a chamber, in a vacuum chamber, with a base pressure of 10 to the minus eight uh, is enough and uh, the, the material start to sublimate. And uh, when we deposit uh, these molecules over a silicon oxide, we have uh, a growth that is well ordered with a backbone of the molecule orthogonal with respect to the surface, and uh, the material grow stack by stack or layer by layer until a certain point. Then after the second or the third monolayer, it starts to grow in a 3D mode so you have a strastic Krastanov mode, growth mode. A typical morphology of a film in a submonolayer configuration, so when you have a, a small amount of material deposited on the surface, is formed by Iceland, which are well separated one each other. So this type of configuration of the film, in this case a submonolayer film, is perfect for understanding the growth mechanism of the, of the film and how the, the film can be formed by coalescing all the Iceland of the film to form a continuous layer. And uh, from this point of view, uh, alpha sexitiophone, that is the molecule that we have used for this study, but there are other molecules like pentacin or PDI uh, or perylene der derivative, uh, have uh, roughly the same type of growth. Uh, in Iceland, then coalesce and form a continuous field. And this work on scanning probe microscopy starts also uh, in a time where we do 
bimodal AFM, which is a technique uh, where the um, a signal of the second mode of the oscillation of the cantilever is overlapped uh, with respect is my daughter, <laughs> is overlapped uh, <laughs> to the uh, resonant frequency of the cantilever. So you are able to increase uh, the phase contrast uh, of the material uh, by using this technique. And uh, this technique was developed inside uh, of a European project called Force Tool that was guided by uh, Ricardo Garcia. Now is a technique uh, available in, in the market. And uh, as a first proof of this type of technique, uh, Ricardo used uh, uh, alpha sexitiophin film. And uh, when I, I read the paper, I observed that the height of the uh, sexitiophin was higher than the expected one. So, if you imagine that your molecule, when you deposit the molecule over the surface, stands uh, with the backbone of the molecule um, orthogonal with respect to the surface. So you expect that the, your layer is uh, the length of the molecule thick, is it right? But in this case, uh, the molecule is uh, 24 angstrom, or if you want 2.4 nanometer. But the height of the island uh, in the in the paper of Ricardo was four nanometer high. So there is something that was not correct. So in, in addition, we have done some measurement on, uh, uh, by using attractive and repulsive regime in cutting mode for measuring the height of your sample. And uh, the Heisland change the height of uh, roughly five angstrom. That is too much with respect to the experimental, uh, to the theoretical expected one. In, uh, in the, the theoretical calculation, the expected compression was one angstrom. Instead, experimentally, you have five angstrom of compression. And that is quite strange. So this observation in the paper of Ricardo, in addition to this simple experiment, have pushed further the investigation of the growth of material in the submonolayer regime, especially for this type of molecules. So what I have done, I have redone uh, um, a sample, and I have measured the height of uh, my Heisland in attractive and in repulsive regime. Attractive and repulsive regime is quite simple to, to switch by using uh, the phase uh, image of, the, of your AFM image. In this sense, when, when you are in the, in, in the middle of, of, your inter, in, of your tapping mode regime, you can stay on the right or on the left. When you are on the right, you are in attractive regime. When you are on the left, you are in repulsive regime. And by using the phase and the measure of the phase, you are able to obtain an image which is in attractive and repulsive regime. What change between these two regimes is the force that you apply to produce a tapping mode image. In this sense, you have there a force that is roughly a few in, in the attractive regime, you have something that is as a force which is roughly few hundreds of piconewton. Instead, when you pass in repulsive regime, you press much more on the sample, and you have a force that is roughly around a few nanonewtons, okay? At most, uh, with the very stiff cantilever, you have uh, something like uh, 10, 12 uh, nanonewton, okay? And uh, with respect to the previous samples, in this case, uh, we have a compression which is uh, the expected comp compression of the, of the Iceland, which is roughly two angstrom, which is close to the one angstrom I expect in, in theoretical calculation. So there is something that was different with respect to these samples and uh, the sample used by Ricardo. Uh, in fact, uh, with the, by comparing uh, the uh, attractive and repulsive regime in uh, in theoretical calculation, as you can see in this simulation, when you apply eight nanonewton as a force to the horizon, 
you bend just uh, the first two rings of the molecules. So you, the, the, the molecule is enough stiff to resist to the force of your, the pressure applied to the, to the tip, and uh, you have uh, an expected compression of just uh, one, two Armstrong. What you have measured in the second uh, sample. So in the second sample, this one, we, the theory is in agreement with an experiment. So the question, the, the very, the initial question remains. So why in the first sample we have a compression of five angstrom instead of just one angstrom? And what changed in the first sample? So we retook the, the, the previous sample, the first one, and the, we changed the forces applied to the to the to the sample by the tip uh, by changing the the cantilever oh, has been changed completely. But anyway, what is important is the forces changes from 300 picanewton to 17 nanonewton, as I said before. And uh, as you can see, practically the compression of the cantilever uh, of the island remain the same. So you have. Uh, all the time, five Armstrong. So there is something that is different respect to, respect to the first one sample and the, the last one sample. So by increasing the, the applied force, the height difference remains the same. The first point, the second point that I take in mind is probably my microscope have some problems in uh, calibration. So I have done a very simple experiment that you can use, uh, if you need to calibrate in zeta direction your cantilever, you can take mica and by using uh, HF at 50% uh, and uh, uh, you can immerse your mica sample inside of uh, HF solution at 50% for eight hours and uh, you create some holes. And such holes uh, show the distances between the plane, the crystal plane of your mica sample. And by making the, the measurement of such holes, such steps, we have a sensitivity of AFM in zeta, which is roughly eight picometers. So it's not a problem of sensitivity, or if you want, calibration of our cantilever, or our microscope, if we see a difference, a such high difference between some samples with respect to the, to the next one. Another possibility is to understand if there is a layer of water on the top of uh, your island that increase artificially the height of your cantilever, of your island, sorry. And the, oh, oh, sorry, we have, oh, oh, sorry, oh, no. okay. <laughs> so what we can see is uh, the, the image done in air and the image done in vacuum, and you can see the, 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 the silicon oxide substrate remain in the same position. Instead, the height, the, the, the height distribution of uh, your island shift towards left. So means uh, the height of our samples in, uh, in, the, in vacuum and in air is different of uh, five angstrom. But five angstrom is due to the, to, the, to the layer of water, but the height of your island remains, uh, in any case, higher than the expected one. So the, the water gives a contribution to the height of your island, but it's not the only one contribution. You have, uh, in addition, a layer of molecule flat over your island, which increase the height of Heisland in this type of uh, samples. And uh, another possibility is to change in attractive and repulsive regime the height distribution of your substrate because your substrate, substrate is covered by water. So if you press much or more, you can change the height of your structure because the height in AFM is a relative measurement between the height, the height distribution of the substrate with respect to the height distribution of your island. 
But in this case, uh, the native uh, silicon oxide, which is hydrophilic, with respect to the 60 isons, which are hydroph hydrophobic, does not change so much the height with respect to the measured one. So to summarize this type of observation, we have two samples with two different heights with the same amount of material, but we have different uh, height of the samples. In the case of uh, the second sample, the, the theoretical calculation of the compression of the island is exactly the same of uh, the theoretical one. Instead, in the first one, we have a change in the height of the, of the island due to the fact that we have an additional material on top of the island itself. And uh, we have measured the layer of water as a five angstrom by making a vacuum and air measurement, comparing a vacuum and air measurement on the same sample in the same position. So what's really changed between the two samples? What is strange changes simply the doping concentration of the silicon. The native silicon oxide remains the same in thickness, but changes the doping concentration. And this is the, the key point why the height is different, because the growth of the material is changed due to the change of the surface energy. In that sense, we have done another experiment for understanding exactly what's happened at this in this configuration by depositing molecule on native silicon oxide with different uh, silicon concentration. The, the native silicon oxide is composed by 70 angstrom of uh, non-stechiometric silicon oxide and uh, 13 angstrom of uh, stechiometric silicon oxide, so D-oxide, silicon dioxide. And, uh, the doping concentration changes, the, the diffusion, sorry, of the doping concentration changes depending if you have, if you use boron or phosphorus, okay? So in this sense, you create some defects inside of the stechiometric part of the native silicon oxide, and this changes the number of OH hydroxylic groups on the surface of your silicon oxide. And that change the growth of the material when you deposit molecule over the surface. And in particular, if you have a sample which is uh, evenly doped, you have uh, a more hydrophilic uh, surfaces. Instead, in the case of uh, a slightly doped silicon, silicon you have uh, an increase of number of OH groups, and uh, you have a, a less hydrophilic surface. This type of defect inside of the, of the silicon oxide, as I said, changes uh, the growth of the material. So what we have to do is to create a series of samples to investigate how the films changes by changing the, the substrate. And what is interesting in this point is you have no changes uh, in morphology because the silicon oxide is equal morphologically for all the samples. But you have a change in the chemistry of the surfaces in the sense in the number of hydroxylic groups, this one. And that change the growth of the material. So for, for proving that things, we have done a proof of concept experiment by using a, a, a sample which is composed by diff four regions of evenly doped, evenly doped silicon, oxide, uh, silicon uh, on the base with a, a very low uh, doped silicon. And uh, as you can see, the morphology of the material is completely different. In the center, we have bigger island. In the, in the, in the region with the evenly doped, uh, the, sorry, in the evenly doped region, we have a very small 
isomed more dense. So if we increase the number, uh, the, the doping concentration, we decrease the molecular diffusivity and vice versa. To do that experiment, we change the doping concentration for 10 to 13 to 10 to 19. So we have an order of magnitude of difference. And in such a way, we are able to create a set of samples for investigating some fundamentals of the material growth related to the packing of the molecules and how the molecules diffuse and evolve over the surfaces. The next point is to understand what change from the point of view of the surface energy by changing the surfaces. So we have done a simple contact angle measurement and we extract not just the, the hydrophilic or hydrophobic nature of the surface, but we extract the um, surface energy of, the, of our samples. And uh, what you can see by using an overwind uh, um, relation for calculating uh, the surface energy, we have a peak of a surface energy roughly in correspondence to a concent doping concentration on 10 to 15, 10 to 16 uh, atoms per centimeter cubed. So we have described our surfaces, we have an idea that changes the morphology by changing the substrate, not morphologically, but just changing the doping concentration. So we are able to make a set of samples by depositing the same amount of material. Uh, for understanding these processes, we have a, a little bit of theory. We, we have to know a little bit of theory regarding uh, the growth of the material. When you deposit molecule over the surfaces, you can have three type of growth. Or you have a, a layer by layer growth mode, which means uh, the molecule are deposited, you form a layer, continuous layer. Then you deposit more molecule, another layer is completed and so on and so forth. So you are able to create a perfect structure layer by layer. Clearly that one is not so simple and in most of the case, probably in quasi totally case of uh, deposition, you have a, a Frank, uh, sorry, a strasky krastanov growth mode. So you pass from 2D to a 3D growth. Instead, the, the other extreme is a 3D growth. So means you deposit molecules, you form a 3D structure but the layer is not completed at all. Okay, so these three type of scenarios are um, the scenarios which, which are involved in the growth of the material. Instead, for the wetting condition you have, when you have a surface energy which is uh, lower with a certain limit, you have a Frank van der Merwe, so a layer by layer growth mode, or you have a, a volmer weber so a 3D growth mode. From the shape of our island, we can extract also the energy for form our island, okay? And this is the process which is included for the nucleation process for form an island, and the form of our, island, of our horizon described by the fractal dimension or the calculation of the critical cluster size, so the, number, the minimum number of molecules needed to form a cluster stable for form an island uh, and has been calculated by this relation. So when uh, there is a process, uh, when we deposit molecule, where there is a, an absorption process where the stable critical nucleus is formed. Then, due to the molecular diffusion, the molecule forms an island, and the island evolves from nuclei to island and to uh, coalesce one each other to form a continuous film. A morphological analysis, which is possible just uh, scanning through microscopy in this sense, uh, 
uh, has been done uh, overall all samples for three different temperature with this, by depositing the same amount of the material, so 50 nanograms, at the same pressure, 10 to the minus eight. And uh, we have done a lot of uh, images uh, at different scales because uh, by changing uh, the surface energy changes also the size of the, of the ice. And so you have to change the scan size of your uh, pictures or your image. This is a set of image and what is impressive is a part of the number of images and the, the quality of the images but the, the question is by changing the surface energy so in the column you can see how the shape and the size of the island changes by depositing the same amount of the material. So that is, there are a lot of processes that, in, that are involved uh, in this type of experiments. For example, when you deposit uh, at room temperature, you don't have any re-evaporation phenomenon. So all the molecules are absorbed over the surfaces. So in principle, you have a lot of, the, a lot of material over the surface. And uh, in fact, you have uh, a more dense films, okay? In the case of, uh, by increasing the temperature, the number of isons are decreased, but the size of isons are increased, and so on and so forth. So, we start with the, the first morphological analysis by using uh, the surface coverage with respect to the, the doping concentration. As you can see, you have uh, like uh, a, a peak, more or less, in any case, uh, changes, in, this, in, the, in correspondence to, the, to 10 to the 15 to 10 to, the, to 16 um, doping concentration, which is exactly what we have found uh, in the non-contact, uh, uh, sorry, in the, in the um, uh, contact angle experiment. So what change by varying the, the doping concentration changes the sticking coefficient, which depends uh, on the doping concentration. In addition, that is clear, but is normal, by increasing the temperature, you increase uh, the desorption. That is uh, an, uh, uh, obvious uh, changes. By changing uh, the shape, by measuring, sorry, the, sh the shape of uh, our island by using the fractal dimension, we are able to understand that this clear point uh, um, in between the changes in between the surface energy between 10 to, to 15, 10 to 16 is clearly uh, correlated to the change of the shape of our horizon. In particular, in, the, in this range, we have a change of the shape that goes to, towards uh, a diffusion-limited aggregation shape. And what we can correlate the fraction, if you can correlate the fractal dimension to the growth of the material, you can see if you have something as a fractal dimension number that is lower than 1.5, you have a, a Volmer Weber growth, so a 3D growth. Instead, in the case of a, a, a fractal dimension larger than 1.5, you have a Frank van der Merger, so a layer by layer growth mode. We have clearly a bell shape, and for extreme values of doping concentration, we have a lower, the lower fractal dimension. Instead, as I said, in the range of where the, the surface energy increases a lot, we have a change of the fractal, a really sharp change of the fractal dimension towards a diffusion-limited aggregation. Then we can measure, as I said at the beginning of this part, we can measure the energy involved in this process. And we can see that the energy is, shows a linear increase of the, of the surface energy. And we can think that we have an increasing trend of surface, uh, of um, nucleation energy when we increase 
the surface energy of uh, our samples. And the number of molecules needed for forming a stable cluster of, uh, of molecules to form a bigger island and to form a, a continuous layer is independent of the, of the doping concentration because we have roughly uh, a, number of, a minimum number of molecules which uh, runs from two to three number of mole molecules. Come back to the height of this uh, uh, island. We can now understand why the, the height of the, our island in the first experiment was so different. As you can see there, all different processes are involved in the formation of the island. And these processes depend on the surface energy of our sample. So, when we change the surface energy of our sample and we change the temperature of our processes for growing island and for growing films, we can see that in our point where the surface energy has a peak, we have an, a decreasing of our height. So this means we have a, a larger diffusivity of the molecule. Even the molecule can be down to the top of the island towards the substrate to form a real layer by layer uh, growth mode film. So the height difference definitely are uh, due to the molecule of the second layer. So there are on the top of, the, of, the, of our island some molecule which will be used uh, to the growth uh, during to the growth of the film for forming the second layer of, the of, of our film. And uh, in conclusion, we have uh, observed a shape transition from contact uh, at low doping concentration to fractal, medium, and to a compact uh, to height doping concentration. The nucleation energy, as you said, changes, increase constantly with respect to the doping concentration, and the coverage depends on the doping concentration. Uh, clearly, the desorption is aff affected by the substrate temperature. The fractal dimension has a, a bell shape uh, uh, with respect to the doping concentration, the minimum number of molecules needed for forming uh, an island are independent with respect to the doping concentration and the height, height changes from the expected one to a very height of island is roughly 4.3 nanometer in some cases. So it's completely dependent on the, on the substrate. The defect, in, in addition, the defect play a key role in the formation of the films. And if you, want if you want to control the film fully, you have to understand how morphologically it evolves. It's not enough to deposit molecule and form a film. If you want to really control the films and control the electrical properties of the material, you have, or other property of the material, you have to control and to understand how the molecule are interfaced with respect to the, to the substrate, which is the first interfacial point of the molecule during the growth. And uh, just for, for showing uh, what we have done uh, in Bologna, in addition, uh, is just for concluding, uh, we have changed a bit uh, the, the concept uh, of a CNR in general, in the sense, of mo in most of the cases in the laboratory of CNR, uh, bosses think that instruments are uh, themselves. So the, a laboratory is a, a closed laboratory. Instead, in our case, uh, we have the idea to share as much as possible the knowledge of scanning probe microscopy uh, inside of the CNR, but also outside with collaboration with the university or other places. So we have done a laboratory, which is possible to 
use microscope, you learn microscopy, but uh, you is not the services. You, la you learn how to do scanning for microscopy images. It's different technique. In particular, uh, is, uh, <laughs> it's inverted, but uh, you can understand anyway. We have microscope that goes from uh, liquid, uh, from, uh, we start, we change the environment. Uh, we, we have some microscope that goes from liquid to air, to electrostatic force or uh, Kelvin probe, uh, vacuum and air and vacuum and uh, ultra high vacuum. Now we have also implemented the ultrasonic force microscopy and we are uh, in plan to implement the non-contact AFM for high resolution images. We have also uh, two microscope for didactic, for um, dissemination also, which are one in uh, physics uh, at the laboratory of Tobias and one at the Fondazione Golinelli, which is a, a, um, a place where dissemination is, uh, um, first, uh, is uh, the first thing of uh, the, the place. And uh, you can book your microscope and uh, you can use uh, uh, a server for making uh, or backup or exchange data, but also you have a, a workstation for data analysis. So, it's a place uh, where you can really make scanning probe microscopy by people that do scanning probe microscopy all days, uh, but you can learn uh, a lot of things uh, and uh, you can learn how to make scanning probe microscopy. This is my collaboration project and knowledge, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Albonetti for this interesting talk. And the talk is now open uh, for discussion. Please be aware, uh, after discussion, uh, we will have lunch. But nevertheless, uh, I don't let you go to lunch uh, until we don't have uh, at least two questions. <laughs> so, if you're hungry. No, but I know that is quite out, is not, only devoted to scanning probe microscopy is more devoted to on uh, uh, growth of material. So you have to imagine that is more uh, this work is uh, more topographic or standard AFM, not a particular technique. So okay, I start with the first question. Then just one for you, uh, Keeps. <laughs> um, you have, you've uh, changed uh, the surface energy by doping uh, the substrate, and then you clearly showed that uh, uh, the growth was influenced by that. But actually, does the doping not only the, um, affect the integral change of surface uh, energy, but it will also change probably the surface energy distribution, and you get these critical points where your crystallization, your growth starts, and you should actually map the surface energy distribution to explain more in detail what you're doing. Uh, that is a great point. Uh, is a, an, that measurement are integral measurement essentially, because uh, I have done, if you look at the, the, the scale bar of uh, AFM images, but also the contact angle, which is an integral one as a measurement, uh, what is interesting at that point, you have a change, locally change of the island with the a property that is a, a integral property of the surface. But I think that by scanning probe microscopy, probably, the, in, my mind, in my mind, the idea is this one. You can investigate, as I, as I saw a few years ago, there are some technique that is able to measure the surface energy locally by scanning probe microscopy. So if you are able to correlate a place uh, the real, uh, the real in situ measurement, in the sense you have the same place and you deposit the molecule in the same place, you are able to understand how the growth really change locally with respect to the surface energy. That is quite complex to do because uh, you have, uh, you cannot do the same thing in, uh, in, in vacuum, is it possible? 
but it's difficult to, to find exactly the same position. So an idea could be, for example, you create a mask with the regions and uh, you study the surface energy of such region and then you deposit the molecules so you are able to find exactly the same region. Uh, the microscope in high vacuum is able also to do growth in situ and in real time, but uh, in that sense uh, is only in ultra high vacuum. So changes also the surface energy by changing uh, the, the, the ambient. So when you go in ultra high vacuum, the contrast should be more difficult with respect to the, to the, to the measurement done in air. It's, it's more difficult to produce images in this sense because contact in ultra high vacuum is more complex. Okay, oh, we have a question. Even if it comes from Bologna. <laughs> you want to go to it. <laughs> Um, very interesting, but what, um, have you ideas on how the doping density impacts on the surface? Because at the end you are growing on an oxide layer, I yeah. imagine. So, in your opinion, what's, what's the reason for this effect? Have you, have you any, any ideas, any microscopic uh, model for that? Or? Uh, I need, really I need some other, in fact I'm searching another technique to investigate how the doping is diffused inside, because essentially the problem, the changes of the surface energy or the, the property of the surfaces, if you want a number of hydroxylic groups, has been changed by the diffusion of the doping from the silicon to the silicon oxide when the native silicon oxide is formed. For example, I have done a simple experiment. You put your, your substrate in silicon in HF, you remove fully the silicon oxide, even the non-stechiometric, you have a, a silicon surface flat, and then you wait one month, roughly, to have exactly the same silicon oxide. And the, the properties come back exactly in the original one. So, for sure, is a diffusion of the molecule of the atoms of the doping from the silicon to the silicon oxide. Because you know that when you have the silicon surfaces, the silicon oxide started to grow, but uh, uh, take uh, a part of the silicon essentially. So a part of the silicon, the surface, the, the superficial part of the silicon has become from silicon to silicon oxide. So you have a diffusion of the, of the atoms inside of the silicon oxide. They form defects inside it and uh, changes the properties, uh, the, changes the surface property of the silicon oxide. Another point is if you look, uh, there are two types of uh, uh, doping, boron or phosphorus. Phosphorus is bigger with respect to the boron. In fact, if you look at the bell shape in the, in the, oh, I, I can show you. If you look the bell shape of the, uh, yeah, this one, in the contact angle, if you look the bell shape of the surface energy is uh, practically due just to the boron component. This is boron, the red one, I don't know if you look uh, red and blue. Anyway, Red are this, 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 and this. This is boron. So the bell shape and the change of the surface energy is due to the boron. Instead, phosphorus is bigger, so don't penetrate too much in the silicon oxide. So it doesn't change the surface energy of our surface. And uh, this is a key point, but I need another technique to measure what you said to understand better how the, the, the silicon oxide changes with respect to the doping. It's not simple because the amount of doping is very low. Okay, I think this is a good closing remark. We like to thank the speaker. Thanks. We are now in time.